There's a lot that can be said about Fermat's last theorem. Over the last three to four hundred years, it's encompassed some fantastic mathematicians, some new mathematical concepts, some intrigue, and a little bit of controversy as well. What I'm going to do today is precisely what I've said in the title. It's, this is an introduction, so it's pretty basic level, and I'm going to confine myself to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. I'm going to do this in three sections. Firstly, what are we trying to prove? Secondly, a high-level overview of the proof. And then finally, I'll explain some of the characters or concepts that appear in that high-level overview of the proof. So let's start with what we are going to prove. It's very easy to find two numbers that are square numbers, that when we add them together we get a square. So for example, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. Fermat's last theorem says that you can't replace the 2 with any higher number. So it's impossible to get two cubes that are added together to get a cube. It's impossible to get two fourth powers that add together to get a fourth power. And take any number uh, greater than 2. It's impossible to take two hundredth power numbers and add them together and get a hundredth power number. So now let's go on to the second part which is a high-level overview of the proof. The first thing I want to do is simplify the problem a little bit. It was pretty quickly proven that Fermat's last theorem is true in the case of cubics and fourth powers. When someone came along to try and prove it for sixth powers, which we've got down the bottom there, it was pointed out that a sixth power is itself a cubic. So I could rewrite this last line here a squared all cubed plus b squared all cubed etc. Now since we've already proven that you can't sum two cubes to get a cube that immediately knocks out uh, the sixth power case. In fact it knocks out every case where the power is divisible by three. And that one before we saw before the one a to the hundredth plus b to the hundredth well that can't be true because a hundredth is itself a fourth power. So if you follow that all through, it tells us that we really only need to look at the prime powers, not every power. So if we go back to our original problem, it would suffice to just change this number n to a prime p. So we're continuing to work our way through a high level overview of the proof. And we've just established that we can simplify the problem a little bit. Now there are many ways to prove things. The proof of Fermat's last theorem is a proof by contradiction. And I just want to go through a very simple example of proof by contradiction so that we can then uh, better appreciate and understand the, uh, the high level overview of the proof of Fermat's last theorem. So here's a trivial example. Theorem. There are an infinite number of odd numbers. So let's look at the proof. We start out by supposing to the contrary that there are a finite number of odd numbers. So we haven't proven that, we're just making that supposition. Now we list a whole lot of logical statements that follow from our supposition. So if there are a finite number of odd numbers, then we can say, then we can list all the odd numbers in ascending order. 1, 3, 5, all the way up to m, where m is the largest odd number. That immediately follows from our supposition. Then we make another logical statement. Consider the number m plus 2. It is an odd number. It must be odd because it's 2 more than m, which is odd. And it's bigger than m. So that follows from the previous logical statement. And now we have the contradiction. This contradicts the statement that m is the largest odd number. We just said that m was the largest odd number. Now we've shown that there's a bigger number. So the... The only thing that can be wrong here is the supposition, because everything else is just logical statements, which must be correct. So the supposition that there are a finite number of odd numbers is false, and therefore there are an infinite number of odd numbers. OK, now we're ready for a high-level overview of the proof of Fermat's last theorem. We want to prove that Fermat's last theorem is true. So we're going to suppose, to the contrary, that Fermat's last theorem is false. 
That is, for some a, b and c greater than 0 and some prime p greater than 2, we have that a to the p plus b to the p equals c to the p. I mean, that's what it means for Fermat's last theorem to be false. It then logically follows that the elliptic curve, y squared equals x times x minus a to the p times x plus b to the p, has no associated modular form. That directly follows. But all elliptic curves have an associated modular form. This is the thing that uh, Wiles and subsequent mathematicians proved. So here we have a contradiction. We're saying that all elliptic curves have an associated modular form, but we've got an example above of an elliptic curve that has no associated modular form. So because of this contradiction, we can only surmise that our initial supposition is false. And that means that Fermat's last theorem must be true. Now we move to the last section, which is the important concepts. And here I want to just try and explain what some of these terms mean. What is an elliptic curve? What is a modular form? And what does it mean for an elliptic curve to be associated with a modular form? For our purposes today, elliptic curves are any curve of this form here, where d, e, f and g can be any integer. However, we specifically exclude curves that have cusps or these sharp points and also curves that intersect themselves. And so we're typically left with these, these two sorts of curves, this sort and this sort here. So the curve that we mentioned in the proof, this one, uh, falls into the category of being an elliptic curve. Um, just for example, let's make a equal 2, b equal 3, and p equal 5. And let's put up a graph of what that curve looks like. So let's move on to the second important concept, and that's the idea of modular forms. So many people, when I mention the word function, will think of something like fx equals x squared. And here they're thinking of x being maybe a counting number, say 3, or an integer, say minus 4, or a fraction, say a half, or an irrational, say the square root of 2. But we can extend this concept to complex valued functions. So here's the complex plane, and here we have a, a number, 1 plus i. And over here we have the result of applying a function to a point z on the complex plane. And if the function was, say, if z equals z squared, then this z over here, which is 1 plus i, would be squared, and that turns out to be 2i, so it would end up over here. And this function could uh, apply to every point on the complex plane. So every point on the complex plane over here would be mapped onto another point on the complex plane here. Now for modular forms, we, for reasons I won't go into now, just uh, use the top half of the complex plane. And modular forms are functions that have this property that for some integer k, we have that f of az plus b divided by cz plus d is equal to cz plus d all to the k times fz. This is for all z and for all integers a, b, c, d with a, d minus b, c equals 1. So this is, to go back up here, if this was the point z, uh, we're saying this point over here may be a, z plus b divided by c, z plus d. When we map these two points using the function, we get these two points over here. And the modular form has a very definite relationship between these two results over here. And this applies for every value of z. So here's an example. We may have a function such that f of 3z plus 1 divided by 2z plus 1 equals 2z plus 1 squared times f of z for all z. And this would be a modular form of weight 2. We say 2 because we've got a 2 up here. Now for what was used for Fermat's last theorem, there was an interest in, in, a, in modular forms with an additional condition. And that revolves around the value c. 
So here's an example um, where we might restrict ourselves to where C is multiples of 11. So that means that this equation would apply for all Z and also this equation would apply for all Z. Remember we still must have that AD minus BC equals 1. And this is a modular form of weight 2 because of the 2 that we talked about before but we would now say that it's a modular form also of level 11. So now we turn to the final important concept and that is a statement in the proof that all elliptic curves have an associated modular form. Which is, this is really amazing, two seemingly unrelated things, elliptic curves and modular forms, and there is this, some sort of link between them. So what is this association? And this actually is the, this final part, all elliptic curves have an associated modular form, is what Andrew Wiles and subsequent math mathematicians have proven. Um, I haven't actually met Andrew Wiles, um, although I did have dinner with someone who's got an office near him and he said Andrew came in one day and said he'd solve Fermat's last theorem. So, oh, that's my brush with fame. Um, the other one, I suppose, is I've got a, a collaboration distance with Andrew Wiles of four because I've jointly published a paper with a mathematician, Igor Spolinsky, who's published with Friedlander, who's published with Rubin, who's published with Wiles. So that's my brush with fame. So now let's have this elliptic curve up here. I'm going to do this by example. Here's an elliptic curve and let's just quickly get up a graph of it and we can see that it's, it is a genuine elliptic curve. It doesn't have a cusp and it doesn't uh, intersect with itself. And what we're interested in is solutions to this problem, integer solutions, but we're not going to use all the integers. We're just going to use a limited number. This is the area of modular arithmetic or clock arithmetic, some people call it. And it's the idea that if, if I ask you what's three hours after 10 o'clock, you're not going to say 13 unless you're in the military. You're going to say it's um, 10, 11, 12, 1, 1 o'clock. So in, in, in the clock world, 10 plus 3 equals 1. Now, what I'm going to show you here applies for prime numbers. So I'm going to do the first one in a bit of detail using the prime number 3. So we're in, in, in modulo 3 land. Um, all we have are the numbers 0, 1, 2. So the question is, how many solutions are there to the elliptic curve using um, 0, 1s and 2s? So there is a, there are four solutions, actually. Here are the four solutions. And I'll just show you with, say, x equals 2y equals 2y, that's a solution. So here are some calculations where you can see that after we go through looking at the left and the right-hand side and applying the rule that you can only have 0, 1 and 2. So we're interested in remainders of numbers if they're over that, uh, that you can see that in fact it is a solution. So we've got the prime of 3 and we've got four solutions uh, to the elliptic curve. So now let's introduce the modular form. This is a function. So it's quite a, it's quite a lot to look at. The first thing is I've simplified it um, uh, by using q uh, to replace e to the power of 2 pi i z. So there is a z on the right hand side, it's just buried in all the q's. And you can see this is a, a complex valued function. We feed in a z, a complex number, and what comes out of it will be a complex number. And there's a bit of a pattern as you go across. We've got here 1, the power of q is 1, then 11, 2, and then 22, 3, and then 33, and on it goes. This turns out to be a modular form of level 11, so it satisfies those conditions we saw before. Now, when we expand this out, we, um, we can collect all the similar terms or similar powers of q, so we get q minus 2q squared, and, and on it goes. And we can read off the coefficient of q cubed, and we're doing that because we're interested in this prime of 3 and we get negative 1. So it turns out that if we want to know the number of solutions to the elliptic curve modulo 3, then we can take the 3 and we can subtract the coefficient in the modular form. So what I'm saying is there are four solutions and 4 equals 3 minus negative 1. So now let's have a look at some others. I've put up here 5 and 7, and I'll also just for fun put up 101. And you can see that in all cases, 
if we take the prime number minus the coefficient in the modular form that we end up with the number of solutions for the elliptic curve modulo that prime. And this works for all primes except 11 because this is 11, a level 11 modular form. It won't work necessarily work for that, but it'll work for all the others. And that's really the, the theorem that was proved that, it, that led to the, uh, the proving of Fermat's last theorem. So I hope you've um, enjoyed getting this first sort of introduction to the proof of Fermat's last theorem. And I hope if you want to go a bit further, this will be a good foundation for you to explore a little bit more about, you know, the history of Fermat's last theorem or modular forms or elliptic curves or anything else that I've mentioned today.